Welcome everyone to the Texas Children and Nature Network's webinar, Using Nature in Times of Grief. My name is Alice Jansen and I am the Education Evans Coordinator with the Texas Children and Nature Network and we are excited to have you all with us today. You will see that there is automated closed captioning for this workshop. You can click the show caption CC button on the Zoom toolbar for the live transcript options. We are recording our session today. We do ask to save bandwidth that you turn off your cameras and mute yourself during the presentation. I will be monitoring the chat so you can share your questions there and I will share them with our presenter during the Q&A portion of the presentation. We have Yasmin Anderson with Austin Parks and Recreation Department's Cities Connecting Children in Nature program running our tech support today and she's also taking attendance. So thank you very much. I will be sharing the recording link of today's session in a follow-up email. If you are uncomfortable with your name showing, you can change your name to anonymous and then private message Jenny, Jenny, not Jenny, <laughs> Yasmin uh, with your name for our attendance. Also, if your Zoom name doesn't match the name you registered with, please change your name or private message Yasmin with your name. All right, so this next part is important, so please listen carefully. Only the registrants that attend the live webinar are eligible to receive a certificate of completion. We do not automatically send all the, all the attendees a certificate. You must request the certificate after attending the live webinar. The email you received with the webinar Zoom link has the specific instructions for requesting the certificate. Attendance is taken during the live webinar and we will check our attendance list to confirm your participation. We need the name you registered with to issue the certificate. So if you have any questions about that, you can private uh, message me or Yasmin. I'm going to go ahead and read the land acknowledgement. Texas Children and Nature Network is headquartered in Austin, and as such, I am on the ancestral and unceded land of the Tonkawa, Comanche, and Sana people. Our ongoing colonial presence on indigenous lands compels us to take action now to counteract the effects of colonization. The work we do through the Texas Children and Nature Network is one small step towards that effort. And here in a moment, I will put some information in the chat to learn more about land acknowledgements and these indigenous peoples groups. We have planned a very special webinar for you all today on using nature in times of grief with Dr. Amanda Wedegrove Romine. She is a licensed psychologist in San Antonio. And thank you so much for being here today, Amanda. I'm gonna let you go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Yep, thanks, Alice. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Perfect, okay. So I will, um, be 100% transparent and say that tech is not my forte. So I'm going to try to manage my slides and also kind of keep up with the chat. Um, but Alice, I know you're going to help me with that. So I want to thank you all um, at Texas Children and Nature for having me back. I've done a presentation before a few years ago, but uh, talking about grief and nature is, is really near and dear to my heart. Um, and I will explain why here in a, a minute. But um, like Alice said, my name is Dr. Amanda Wedegrove Romine. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm a psychologist in San Antonio. And uh, my job as a psychologist is really to synthesize research so that it's easy for my clients to understand and simple to apply in their day-to-day -day lives. And so everything that I talk about is uh, grounded in research. However, when I talk about nature and grief, it really is grounded in my own personal real life experiences doing this because I have used nature to navigate my own grief. My, my dad was killed unexpectedly years ago, and I like to say now that I literally hiked my way through my grief. I picked up hiking, and I just found that in addition to some of the more traditional mental health tools like therapy and medication, that being in nature really helped me process that grief uh, a little bit you know, more each time I was on the trail. And this is what ultimately led me to the uh, purpose that I found as a psychologist, which is teaching everyone, but women in particular, how to harness the mood boosting power of nature. 
Before we go on, I want to just acknowledge that this is a difficult topic, especially if you are early in a grief journey. And so I'm going to share some resources at the end, some mental health resources that you may find useful, but I just want to encourage everyone to take care of themselves during this presentation in whichever ways that you need to do that. You know, it's certainly appropriate to step away if it, you feel like your emotions start to overwhelm you. Um, and just, you know, please stay mindful of your emotions. And then a short disclaimer here that this this uh, presentation is for educational purposes only, and it doesn't constitute uh, a doctor-patient relationship, although I am happy to connect you with resources for um, that if you need them at the end, and I'll give you some information at the end how, on how to do that. So our outline for today um, is just most importantly to normalize grief and the grief process. I know that we are in a culture where a lot of normal and natural kind of emotional processes seem to get pathologized. And so you will hear me time and time again throughout this say that grief is normal and natural and part of life as we move through significant losses and even significant transitions, right? So saying goodbye to loved ones, yes, but also entering new seasons of life or, you know, transitioning in careers or, you know, having to say goodbye to a part of our life that we weren't expecting. And, and that's all really, really hard. And nature can really provide a pathway to healing and for processing our emotions and being a source of comfort. I imagine that all of you here, if you're here at a Texas Children in Nature presentation, you already know that you really understand the, the power of nature, but we're going to really kind of dig in today and talk about that some more. And then I think the other thing um, that I want to just mention is while I do not see children as a psychologist um, and all of the work I do is with adults, I think that we can also consider how we can use these rituals that I'm going to talk about today and nature in general to open up conversations with our little ones and have age appropriate conversations about really difficult topics like grief with our kiddos. Oh, well, let me just go through this. Um, so yeah, in addition to normalizing grief, you know, I'm going to talk specifically about rituals. Um, and then I'd like to, if we have time, just kind of synthesize some of the research that we have on nature and mental health in managing um, difficult emotions and, and the difficult emotions specifically that come along with grief. If we have time, I'd also like to spend a few minutes uh, with y'all kind of thinking about your own nature rituals, especially as we're moving into the holiday season here soon, which is, is pretty difficult for people who are grieving. And then, of course, we'll have some time for Q&A and some open discussion. So you're going to hear me say this multiple times. Uh, grief is a natural response to the loss of a loved one or the loss of a anticipated, you know, expected way of life or thing that we thought was going to be present in our life. That can be the loss of a person or a pet. It can be a relationship or a job or some other component of our identity. It can also be health, right? Um, deterioration of health or loss of mobility, so on and so forth. And the other thing that's important to remember is that it's deeply personal, meaning that I don't grieve uh, like you grieve and you're not going to grieve like your sister grieves. We all have our own unique way of moving through that. And so it's not very helpful to compare ourselves to other people when we are moving through grief. With that being said, for most people, the symptoms of grief do begin to decrease over time. And a small group of us um, may find that the feelings of grief, intense grief, persist so much so that we have difficulty like managing our day-to-day -day life. Um, sometimes the symptoms can be severe enough to cause problems and stop us from continuing with our lives. And in those cases, there is a diagnosis called prolonged grief disorder 
um, that is characterized by this intense and persistent grief um, that is overwhelming enough to cause problems in day-to-day -day life. And if that is happening, you should certainly seek professional support. Um, again, this is not diagnostic today, but I just want you to be aware of that difference between acute versus prolonged grief. So, like I just said, this is not diagnostic. Um, you know, if you check the boxes on many of this, this does not mean you have prolonged grief disorder. Um, this is a list of problems that lots of us experience when we are navigating grief. And you can see here, grief is felt emotionally, it's felt physically, it's felt cognitively, and behaviorally. So it really does wreak havoc on the whole system. And if you've ever experienced that, you know what I mean. Um, and while these symptoms are really painful, again, they're normal and natural. And I'm going to offer some research-backed nature interventions at the end of this presentation so that hopefully if you are experiencing some of this stuff, you will have some ways, you'll walk away with some practical ways to gain some relief for many of these symptoms. Um, and so if you look at these, right, I mean, these sound horrible, <laughs> um, and I have certainly been there. I uh, specifically resonate, I think there's one here, oh, getting easily irritated and or having angry outbursts. Um, when my dad was killed, that was something that I really, really struggled with, and it, at the time, alienated a lot of the people around me because I was just very difficult to be around at the time. And so if you're experiencing that, that is normal. Changes in appetite, trouble with sleep, um, feeling like it's just really like it's just really hard to believe what has happened. Um, difficulty thinking about the future, thinking about having any future without the person or pet that you lost. And then, you know, kind of finding ways to numb out because these symptoms can become so overwhelming. And then a lot of people that I work with in therapy, you know, come with these big spiritual and existential questions about the meaning of life and so on and so forth. And so nature can really kind of provide a really wonderful space to sort some of that out. And so why would we use nature in our processing of grief? Um, it says here that it facilitates mindfulness versus moving through your grief in a fog, and it fosters perspective within the context of the larger world and can be a reminder of the cyclical nature of life and death. And you might wonder, why in the world would I want to be present in my life and be mindful to my life and have perspective when this moment in life is so, so painful? And this is what I experience for myself and what I hear from my clients is that a lot of meaning making can occur if we are able to sit with that discomfort and that distress that's associated with, with grief. And the meaning making can come specifically in the service of learning more about our own values, thinking more about the legacy that we want to leave. Um, or developing a new identity after a life transition or an identity disruption. I think that if you've ever been out in nature, right, you may have experienced this sense of connection with something, right, or someone, whether it's, you know, something bigger than you or the universe or God, but it can also nurture a sense of connection to our loved ones if we use it in strategic ways. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And also a lot of rumination can occur um, during grief. So things like, uh, like I, I'm thinking about when my dad passed away and I, I really kind of ruminated a lot on the, like the actual last moments of his life and what that was like for him. I think, you know, we can have thoughts like, did I do enough? Did my loved one know that I loved them? Could I have said more? Or we ruminate about last conversations. This is all quite typical, but there is research that shows that 
the visual and auditory stimuli that's found in nature can dial some of that down and make that a bit more tolerable. And then it can also evoke um, a sense of awe and gratitude. So awe is this sense of wonder and amazement and reverence that helps us feel connected to something bigger than ourselves. And awe and gratitude in particular have been linked to life satisfaction, reduced stress, greater happiness, connectedness to others, and increased mindfulness. And so we can find those things in nature um, if we're spending time there and, and doing some things, again, strategically to navigate our grief process. So like I said, I'm going to talk mostly about using nature in the form of rituals to navigate grief. And I really became aware of the power of rituals after my dad died in 2018. Like I shared, my love for hiking was born out of going out into nature alone. Um, so I had a quiet and still place to remember him. And also um, this space to really process through my emotions after long days of having to, you know, work in a professional setting and sort of keep myself really buttoned up. Um, so it just really gave me the space to process what I was going through. And I've since used rituals uh, to process the loss of loved ones. I lost my chihuahua last year, who I loved so much, um, and we were together for 17 years. I'm also navigating right now the anticipatory grief of losing my grandmother as she um, kind of is in her last season of life and on hospice. And so I've certainly found that the power of rituals as ways to honor our loved ones can help us maintain this symbolic bond with them. And interestingly enough, can almost trick our brain um, into thinking that we have some control when uh, we really don't have much control in life. But rituals can really help us feel like we have a sense of control and provide structure in what feels like really chaotic times because much like ceremonies there's a start and an end to the activity and there's very specific things you are doing during the activity and so that can provide some relief in these really painful times and so i'm going to talk today about five rituals Certainly, this list is not exhaustive. Um, these are only ideas to get you started, but I thought at the very least they would um, cultivate some conversation, um, hopefully in the chat or people can, you know, take themselves off mute here in a little bit. But I really want this to kind of be uh, just a, a jumping off place for you thinking about rituals that you can use to manage your own grief um, experiences. Because like I talked about before, grief really is very unique to each person. And so the first thing that I want to talk about is creating a nature altar or a mandala. And altars and mandalas are used in religious cultures. So we do want to be respectful of that. Um, however, when used respectfully, they can be a, a powerful source of healing and moving forward. And so I, I didn't mention, mention this before, but rituals can be done individually or as a group or as a family. Um, if you see here, this top right picture um, is a mandala that I created with a group of women at a nature retreat that I went on um, a while back and we were focused on like letting go. And so it was grief in the sense of letting go of something that no longer served us and kind of moving forward. And so you can see with all of these pictures, there's the use of natural elements like stones, leaves, flowers, shells, sticks. You can even use dirt and the items can be arranged in a way that resonates with your feelings or your memories of the person you've lost. And it can serve as something very tangible um, when, again, life feels sort of chaotic and out of control, like you have this specific space you can go to. 
And so you would want to begin by centering yourself, taking a few moments to kind of take deep breaths in, reflect on your grief and the emotion that you're hoping to process. And it's also helpful if you can set an intention before you start. So the intention might be something like, I'm going to spend this time remembering my loved one, finding peace, expressing a, a certain feeling that is really coming up for you, like my example of feeling a lot of anger um, or any other intention that feels meaningful for you. And so after you've kind of centered yourself and set your intention, you would begin with the creation component of this, um, collecting and arranging your materials. And you can see how that's done here in a variety of ways. And I always tell people that are going to do this, like you don't want to overthink it. Just let your emotions and your intuition sort of guide this. Um, I think grief can really stir up a lot of like cognitive stuff in us, a lot of, like I said, rumination, um, catastrophizing, uh, worrying. And so this is really a process to just let intuition guide you and let it guide your choice of colors and shapes and even the pattern that you set it up in. And as you're placing each natural object, you can silently or verbally express thoughts or memories. I think if you're doing this as a family, for example, or you're doing it with your kids, this can be a really beautiful way to like open up dialogue about what they're thinking or feeling um, or what they're worried about. And just kind of let that be like an open dialogue as this is sort of um, being built. And you can also incorporate personal items or mementos. I think, you know, we've all seen altars that are like that during religious ceremonies um, that can remind you of your loved one. And once this is complete and you feel good about the way that it's set up, then you can take some more time to reflect and meditate, sitting quietly, contemplating, you know, the things that were your intention from the beginning. And this can be, you know, indoors or outdoors, permanent, not permanent. Um, when you feel ready, you can disassemble the altar or the mandala. You can leave it in its natural setting. Um, and you may want to even use some closing words. Again, I think the powerful thing about ritual is there's a start and an end to this. And so before leaving or disassembling, you might want to say a few closing words, offer thanks, um, make a personal commitment or something like that. And so I think this is a really beautiful way to use nature to remember loved ones or mark the transition um, if the grief is not related to a person, but is related to um, like a developmental thing that is happening in life or an identity shift, which was certainly the case um, with the, the mandala that I created with this group of women at the retreat. Another, you know, pretty straightforward and um, simple way to incorporate nature into your grief process is by taking nature walks. So this is a picture of a, a wounded warriors group that I went out with several years ago. And you can imagine um, with a group like this, there's a lot of grief happening, um, transitioning out of the military, coping with mental and physical and emotional injuries that you did not expect or anticipate. And so that was the type of intention that we set on this walk. And I would encourage you to set on your own nature walk is, you know, what, what is it that I want to kind of think about or process through in this time that I'm setting aside in nature? When we're outdoors, it can be really helpful to engage our senses, our five senses, or focus on the breath for grounding, getting us really centered in the present moment. We can use the time to talk to our loved ones or find them in natural elements. 
you may have, um, you know, a memory of being with your loved one um, under a tree or watching birds or, you know, so you can really conjure up memories in nature and use that as a way to remain symbolically connected to them each time you go in nature. You might consider journaling um, or voice recording if you prefer that to process your thoughts and your emotions. So um, you may decide, you know, I'm going to within the course of this short ritual walk, pause and kind of sit and reflect and document that as part of your grief process. And then another really beautiful ritual that I have heard has been helpful to clients um, is time observance rituals, right? So sunrise or sunset or after dark, you know, witnessing these different components or these different times in nature can be really powerful reminders of the cycle of life and the passage of time. And that can help us radically accept life and death. And these moments of natural beauty can really evoke that sense of awe that I was talking about before that is um, really helpful in just helping to, us to increase positive emotions that are often missing when we're in the midst of, of um, really painful grief. You might even set an observance at your loved one's favorite time of day or the time of your last call or conversation with them or some other memorable time. But I think that setting aside time and it being symbolic of something that is tied to your loved one can be a really powerful ritual. And then Another idea for managing grief is, you know, you it says memorial planting here. I'm going to kind of expand on that. But I think we've all heard of this, right, or seen it where planting a shrub or a tree or a flower in memory of someone or to mark an important transition in your own life. Um, but something that I've really kind of um, found is very helpful to me is actually caring for uh, funeral plants and shrubs. And so I have plants from both my father's funeral and my grandmother's funeral and caring for these plants over many, many years, not only has symbolized the growth that I've experienced as I've lost them and this resiliency that I've, uh, I feel like I've built over many years, but it really has allowed me to stay connected to my loved ones. Um, each time I sort of prune the plant, uh, I, every spring I try to kind of clean it up a little bit. Uh, each time I water it, right, I really make the intentional, you know, I really uh, intentionally think about my loved ones. And those really help me stay connected to them. So if you don't have funeral plants, that's okay. You could select a plant that may have been meaningful to your loved one. Um, or maybe you just think that they would have liked, right? The colors that they like or something like that. And, and that's a way to really stay connected over like the long haul is um, kind of caring for something as it grows. You might even choose a plant or a flower that's like their birth month um, or something like that. So you can get really creative um, in the ways that we honor our loved ones when we do things like this. And then the last ritual I'm going to talk about before I kind of check in with the audience is a nature getaway. And I recognize this one is probably the hardest one at all to make happen in our lives because we are so busy. Um, however, it can be really helpful to set time to get away. Um, this is a picture of a camping trip that I went on. Um, it was actually my first solo camping trip on my own. And I really wanted to do that as a way to get away and, and process some things that I was going through at the time. You can choose uh, 
geographically a place that you think your loved one would have enjoyed or perhaps a place that y'all went to. Um, I'm actually visiting a friend in a few weeks and we are going out to Yosemite. Her father passed away this year and that was a place that he took her and her siblings camping and hiking when they were growing up. And so we we're gonna go out there together and do some rituals around celebrating his life. And so if you can do that, that's wonderful. If you can't get away, you may just be able to choose a nature element that's symbolic to you or your loved one. Like, you know, the ones listed here, water, fire, things like that. Or like I said before, a geographical area that you think is kind of powerful or moving to you. And you wanna definitely set an intention for the time away. What do you wanna get out of this time that you go away into nature? Um, yeah, so this can be a really, really helpful way to manage grief and navigate it. And one thing that I'll I'll add here is that I want to be clear that these rituals are not like a be all end all, right? It's not like you're going to go out into the woods for a weekend and then come back and your grief is going to be healed and you're going to be, you know, ready to like reintegrate and back into life like nothing ever happened, right? So I want to set the right expectations. Grief is a process. Um, and there will be many stops along the journey, but these rituals can serve as pit stops, if you will, um, places to check in with yourself, um, take care of yourself, and remain connected to your loved one if that's something that's very important for you to do. So I'm going to stop here. Um, and I just want to check in with the audience and kind of make sure everyone is, is following along and, and okay. But I also thought it would be really helpful to give you a chance to envision any rituals that you might create for yourself um, or that you maybe have already engaged in that you would be willing to share with the audience. Like I said, this isn't the be all end all. I'd be really curious to hear how y'all are using nature to manage difficult emotions. I see one question here already that, um, do you have any trainings to recommend for a non-professional to help one begin to lead these types of activities? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I don't have that off the top of my head. However, um, there are certainly certification programs for um, ecotherapy and nature therapy and things like that. However, I think some of these um, are simple enough, perhaps, that you could do them with a small group and just sort of let them evolve organically, right? And I often, um, when I'm with groups of people, like on that Wounded Warriors hike that I was talking about, I sort of let like the group sort of lead that. Um, and I just sort of let it kind of flow naturally. And sometimes that can be really powerful too, to give the people you're with the power to kind of lead and guide that as they are feeling appropriate. But that's a great question. I see Rachel say, I like to use guided birding as a ritual reflection practice regarding cultural and ecological grief. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I'm going to talk a little bit here later about some of the research on listening to bird songs because it's my favorite, one of my favorite things to talk about. And then Rhonda says, I've planted a palm tree everywhere we've lived in honor of my mother. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah, I actually, um, Rhonda, have a plant in my backyard that my um, aunt dug up out of my grandparents' yard that my father had planted like for my grandparents when he was like 16 years old. And the plant grew in their yard and sort of spread. Um, and so she dug some of that up for me after my dad passed away and then I transplanted it into my yard. And so I certainly resonate with that um, kind of feeling that you're talking about of like knowing that your, your loved one is there uh, with you each place that you move to. That's wonderful. 
And then Jasmine says, I use time observance rituals, hiking and journaling in the process. Yeah. Vegetable gardening keeps me connected to my father. That's, yeah. Y'all have great ideas. These are wonderful. Um, and I'm reading, I'm just going to read through these if that's okay. Oh, bear with me. I met my husband on my birthday, had our daughter on her birthday. Wow. And after 32 years of marriage, he passed away on our birthday. Gosh. On a funeral. Oh, that's really cool. The idea of fireworks. Yeah, we didn't even talk about that, but um, kind of like the rituals that happen at night, right? That's really cool, Christy. Yeah, this is all great. Okay, I could read these all day because I really love this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but y'all got y'all get it. Y'all understand this. Um, and there, and I like you know what Anne is saying, right? That these are like pretty simple things. Um, the nature of getaway is, uh, you know, a little more challenging, but a lot of these things are things that we can do with our kids, um, that we can do fairly easily, and that we can just really create a space to talk about grief. Um, I know for me, one of the things I noticed when my father was killed is that no one wanted to talk about it. I think everyone was really nervous around me. Um, you know, they didn't want to upset me. They didn't want to remind me of what had happened, even though that was all I could think about. And so grief can be a really lonely process when you experience that. Everyone's sort of, you know, kind of walking on eggshells around you. And so these rituals really do create a space, especially if you're doing them as a group or with your family to really like have conversations about loved ones. Because oftentimes I found, and my clients have confirmed this as well, all we want is talk about our loved one, right? We miss them. And so these rituals can provide really um, specific ways to create space and like invitation to continuing to continue having conversations about our loved ones and what kind of plants they would like or what you know kind of nature elements they would want to add to this altar and so on and so forth. So, thank you. Okay. So I'm going to, um, just for the sake of time, move us along, but I'm loving these comments. So I always like to provide people with like tangible, practical things that we can do when we're experiencing emotional discomfort and pain. And like we've been talking about, right, the good news is nature is free and elements of it are everywhere. And just to highlight how much time we're spending away from nature at this point, most of us, I don't know about our group here, right? Because I think we're pretty nature minded, but many people are spending up to 10 or more hours a day on their screens and 90% of their time indoors. So disconnecting in nature really is restorative for any brain, but especially a brain that is grieving because we know that there are some things happening in our brain when we are grieving. And so if we think back to that, uh, that slide where it had all of the different symptoms of grief that we might experience, sleep was on there. Sleep is a big problem when we're grieving. And our sleep drive is regulated by light and the sun. And when we don't get regular access, our circadian rhythm can get really out of whack. So getting exposure early in the morning, perhaps by taking a mid-morning walk, can reset our circadian rhythm and help us with sleep if sleep is one of the symptoms that we're experiencing. We also know that our attention and our focus and our concentration are disrupted when we're grieving. So if you've ever been grieving, right, and you've gone to work, it is really hard to concentrate and focus. Um, and you might just feel like your brain is kind of like mush. And so research consistently shows that our attention, our concentration, and our focus are restored when we spend time in green spaces. So that's good news. And we know that even 
little tiny burst of exposure can be micro restorative for the brain. In fact, studies have even shown us that just looking at nature pictures can restore attention and focus in the short term. And so that's good news if you're grieving. And then here, someone was talking about birds. Um, bird songs and other calming nature sounds have been proven to decrease cortisol, which is the stress hormone, hormone and increase our attention. And so that's another way to manage some of these symptoms of grief if you're experiencing them. Bird song in particular has been shown to be very relaxing to our nervous system. And then this is the last slide before I'll kind of shift us into Q&A, but it's just kind of a general um, summary of nature's effects on our mood and some ideas for dosing nature, if you will. So there's research to support that a 90 minute walk in nature can decrease rumination and worry. I certainly, um, looking back at my own grief journey, think that this, what, this is what was so helpful for me after my dad died is I had so much rumination and worry. And I really think that, that is, this is what was happening when I was on those hikes. An even shorter walk, like 50 minutes, can reduce anxiety and negative mood and increase positive mood. And then if we're talking about like longer term nature exposure, there's some research to suggest that 120 minutes in nature over the course of a week uh, can reduce irritability, depression, and anxiety and increase life satisfaction. And so what we know bottom line is that the more time we spend in nature, the less ruminations people seem to have and the more positive effects we seem to have. So I told you that I would offer some resources at the end for those of you who needed them, and, and that is this slide. So certainly there's a suicide prevention lifeline if you need it and a virtual chat. I am also happy to share resources of colleagues that I have um, in Texas that will be able to support those of you who are looking for therapy. And so I've put my contact information here in a QR code if that's easier. But I am certainly, um, I'm certainly happy to help you access resources if that's something that you decide you need. So I will, I guess, ask maybe Alice if there are any other questions that came through that I missed, or if we want to open it up for a general discussion, that's okay with me too. Okay. We do have a, just a comment here from Rachel, 120 minutes a week breaks down to 17.5 minutes a day. Thanks for doing the math for us on that. Makes a daily outdoor ritual much more achievable when written that way. Definitely, I concur. Um, if there's any more questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We have a pretty large group of people on this live webinar. Um, so I think maybe chat might be a better way to, to handle kind of comments and questions. Um, but I will say personally, this is, you know, very important um, information and resonates with me. And I'm sure it resonates with everyone on this uh, webinar in some form or fashion. And I really liked how you organized the information and presented it. Um, lots of tangible ideas that, you know, people can start using, you know, today when they go outside if they wanted. So a couple yeah. of other nice comments. Thank you. This was great. Very affirming. Yes, I agree, Rachel. I prescribe 20 minutes a day, six days a week for children and families I work with. They find it very doable. That was from Jamie Lynn Langley. Um, and then there were a couple of little comments in the chat about the benefits of using this in a school environment for school counselors. So I'm glad that um, that comment was made and that people are are sharing how it would be very beneficial to the work that they're doing. There's a question here from Rachel. Do you ever work with park rangers, interpreters to organize public grief events? That sounds interesting. 
I have not, but that sounds like a really great idea. Um, and I'd be happy to chat offline about that, Rachel, if you want to reach out to me. But yeah, certainly I'm um, a big believer of kind of like normalizing some of this stuff that is kind of not talked about or like I was saying earlier, people sort of walk on eggshells when someone is grieving. We don't really know what to say or how to support them. And so I think being there for each other in nature in these public ways is like a very powerful step. Yeah. Um, Malia shares that it also offers a good dose of vitamin D, which we can be deficient in. And uh, nature is my best healer. Yes, it is. Thanks for that, Vicki. Any other questions or um, examples maybe that you all in the audience wanna share about how you're using nature for grief and any programs um, that work directly with kids, you know, maybe outside of school? I mean, some people already did, but if there's any other tidbits of um, real world examples to share, I think everyone would find that helpful. And I'm also seeing Danny's question about climate grief, um, which is like uh, y'all, Texas Children in Nature, y'all could do a whole presentation on just climate grief alone. Um, it's not my area of expertise, um, but someone in the chat may, may have some information about that. Is climate grief a programmable area of growth? I, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, Danny, but you could add more in the chat. And that is a topic that we um, had as a webinar a few months ago, um, climate change, how to talk to kids about climate change. And there was kind of, you know, that, that fear factor, which could be interpreted as grief. Um, it was messaged a little bit differently, but a similar idea. Um, so that would be a good webinar to reference Danny. And then um, I like the twist on this because there is a grief. I mean, I think everyone feels it. Um, not everyone, but many people feel it regarding climate, climate change and, and the grief that that um, generates. There is a question here from Rachel. Does your work ever overlap with green burial, conservation, funeral, <laughs> funerary? I can't say that word, practices. I am an end of life doula and ATEX that's Austin, and work with a small green cemetery interested in working with the public? No, I'm, I'm a psychologist, so I am mostly working in a therapy space, supporting people with lots of different things, um, grief being just one of the things that I support people through. And um, yeah, so I'm not really working with many publics uh, sectors outside of doing presentations like this occasionally. Hi, sorry to interrupt. I, I've, I've been asking questions, but just wanted to jump in here as well to talk about death cafes because I just wrote the word death cafe and didn't explain it <laughs> entirely. Um, and so I'm an end, so like I said, I am an end of life doula, but so one of the things that happened pre-COVID that was pretty popular were called death cafes, which were one-off events that would take place at a public location, generally speaking, coffee shops or bistros or things like that. Um, and it was an opportunity for just like the general public or specific community groups and things like that to come enjoy a coffee and have conversations on death or grief or different things like that. So just in the sense of like ideas that can happen, especially when it comes to starting the conversation, I've actually hosted a um, death cafe before and it went really well had a lot of like people who didn't even necessarily know how to define grief and then leaving and understanding like what steps to take next was really profound so I highly recommend death cafes and they're things that you can just host yourself kind of a thing thanks for sharing that Rachel I had not heard of that before um we have about 10 minutes left in our dedicated time, but I did put the evaluation in the chat, but please feel free to continue adding comments and questions. Um, someone posted a really good um, 
resource on climate grief and similar issues with the Climate Psychology Alliance of North America. Um, just going back through some of the comments, providing rocks, sticks, leaves, and mud, et cetera, for children to express their feelings at that moment. I like that. And then let's see. Uh, Jasmine, I'm a student of developmental psychology and am interested in eventually working with families and children in outdoor therapy. Are there any therapy programs that I can volunteer with for experience and learning? Great question, Jasmine. Yeah, there are certainly some ecotherapy certification programs. Um, I will uh, be transparent. I am not trained in ecotherapy um, with a certification. However, I talk a lot about being outdoors and being in nature and I follow the research on that and so I would encourage Jasmine to google that I don't know if there's any uh, like volunteer opportunities with those programs I would imagine there are thank you Amanda and if anybody has any insight for Jasmine here in our audience please um, put that information in the chat seems like we have a, a wide variety of folks with us today. I will stop sharing my screen in case you all have anything on your end you have to share or need to share. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, we really appreciate your time today. We do have we do have more time. So if there's anything, anything else, resources, something you want to share, a question. I'm going to continue to put some of my end of webinar information into the chat. Um, we do have um, a webinar coming up in October, October 4th, Once Upon a Time There Was Nature. I'm going to go ahead and put that information in the chat with a link to the registration. Someone says, Jamie says, check out mindfulness-based ecotherapy by Charlton Chuck Hall. He has an eco play program that involves children and families. Interesting. He might be a good webinar presenter. An, an article on eco grief was shared with a link. Please also, yes. Um, and then I do have some information that I would like to include as well about our upcoming summit. So our summit is coming up December 6th through the 8th, and it is in Houston at the C. Baldwin Hotel, which is located um, downtown. And so we're super excited to um, have our summit there, and we have a lot of wonderful things planned. We have 13 um, field-based workshops near the hotel in Buffalo Bayou Park and Tim Houston Park and the Buffalo Bayou Greenways. Um, we have wonderful concurrent um, session presenters and our keynote speakers are Parker McMullen Bushman and Dr. Melissa Lim. Um, and so if you go, actually, I need to get, grab the link. I'll put the link in the chat so that folks can check out all the details about the summit. And hopefully uh, everyone here is planning to attend. Registration is open um, and it's early bird pricing right now through mid-October. I encourage you to check that out. We are still looking for summit sponsors. If you know of, a, of an organization or a company that may be interested in sponsoring our summit, we are still taking sponsorships. So check that out as well. And let me just check as I'm putting all this information in. Let me see if there's any other. We got a thank you. Awesome. There is a question from Dr. Christy Smith. Is there a training certificate available for teachers for this training? Yes, there is. Um, so we um, sent the information in the Zoom confirmation email. So you'll want to um, request a certificate uh, for this specific webinar.
All right. Amanda, do you have any closing thoughts or words? No, I was just thinking this is such an easy group to present to because uh, they all understand the uh, the power of nature. So I think we're all on the same page and it makes sense to everybody. So, but I appreciate you having me. Uh, thank you for inviting me back. Of course, we're happy to have you um, present again and on such an important topic. And um, I know people will be looking over the information that you have shared and we'll probably be in touch if they have any questions. Um, I put some additional links and information in the chat about becoming a Texas Children and Nature Network partner if you're not one already. Um, there's access, of course, to our public webinars, but also special exclusive partner webinars that we offer on a quarterly basis um, and lots of wonderful educational resources um, throughout the year. And then we also encourage you all, if you like these webinars and you would like to help support us um, continuing uh, to bring webinars to you all to consider a donation to the Texas Children and Nature Network. And I think that covers everything that I wanted to share with you all. We appreciate your participation today. And as I mentioned at the top of the webinar, I will be sending out um, a follow-up email with the resources that um, Amanda has shared and then also the uh, recording of this webinar so you can review it again or um, yeah, take notes and that sort of thing. So be on the lookout for that uh, next week. And I'm just scanning the chat one more time to see if there's anything else. Lots of great participation and questions and sharing. So we thank you all for being a live with the audience. We always compliment our webinar audience on being very interactive and asking lots of questions. So it makes it a lot more interesting and fun for everybody when you all participate. So thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close the webinar. Y'all have a great rest of your day and we will hopefully see you back in October for our next webinar on October 4th. Thank you.